Good evening. It is so nice to see everybody here. Welcome. My name is uh, Scott Beerman, and I am just finishing my eighth month here as a, uh, a newbie, a new president of the college. It's great to have everybody here. Welcome. Particular welcome to the Global Health Workshop participants. It's great to have you on campus from uh, other campuses around the country. A particular thanks to the terrific work of the students that presented their posters tonight. That was really wonderful. <laughs> Welcome to our 11th Weisberg Chair in International Studies Address. It is so great to have you here, and we are particularly honored to be joined by our new friend and current Weisberg Chairholder, Dr. Sheila Talau. And let me... <laughs> let me say that in the 11-year history of the Weisberg Chair, Dr. Talau is unquestionably and unequivocally the finest Weisberg Chair that I have welcomed. <laughs> to Beloit College. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, a bright, energetic, rebellious, and dare I say, a little quirky 18-year-old Nina Weisberg eagerly came from her home in Washington, D.C. to Beloit College. She graduated four years later, brighter, more energetic, learnedly rebellious, and perhaps a little even more quirky having earned a degree in English and having developed a passion for anthropology. How Beloitish. <laughs> so happy was her father with her education. And this is important because there is little, at least within my sad and narrow world, little better than a parent who is really, really happy with his offspring's education. So happy was Nina's father with her education that this, and with this school, Boyd College, that he committed to helping the college establish something new, substantive, and central to the mission of the college, something that would draw from the college's strengths and history and speak to the college's future, something that held the potential to be important and profoundly transformative. This parent was Marvin Weisberg, the benefactor of the Weisberg Chair, the Weisberg Scholarships and its related programs in international human rights. For more than a decade now, he and his family have provided our community with a nearly unparalleled opportunity to learn from of some of our world's and era's most inspiring influential and tireless educators, actors, advocates for human rights, peace, and international relations, and <coughs> tireless. They have come from around the world. They are international, interdisciplinary, indefatigable, engaged with the real world, engaged with the world's most troublesome problems, engaged with Beloit students, not for an evening, but for a full week. This is no arm's length visit, no drive-by lecture, no one-night stand, no collect my speaker's fee and on to the next college. This is full contact <laughs> tour of duty. It is not for the weak of heart or body, and it requires only chairs with the finest of character and the ability to cope with sleep deprivation. This vision, this Marvin Weisberg vision, is a vision on steroids. But who would take on such a responsibility, take on the responsibility of the Weisberg chair? For in fact, the Weisberg chair is perhaps one of the most uncomfortable seats in academe. <laughs> if you build it, Mr. Weisberg, will they come? Well, the answer is yes. The answer is that for 11 years we have asked for, and for 11 years we have been graced with the finest of Weisberg chairs. There have been uniformly people 
of the highest character, people who have become important because they deserve to be important, wise, principled, committed, insightful, determined, and generous. Generous, beyond all measure, generous. We ask so much of these retired generals, ministers of education, Pulitzer Prize winners, constitutional court justices, Chinese dissidents, and directors of international aid organizations when they come to our campus. And we have asked so much, an unconscionable song of Dr. Talal, and we have done so with reason. We have done so because we deserve it. <laughs> we have done so because our students, our faculty, our community, we are hungry, voracious, ravenous for the knowledge that these Weisberg chairs have to share. We are opportunistic. We expect to put into practice what we learn and our attention, Dr. Talao, is unwavering. Your time with us matters. Your time is well spent within this community. Marvin Weisberg's vision predicts this and demands this. Marvin Weisberg's vision challenges us to bring to campus people who have helped shape and reshape the very world in which we live. And Marvin Weisberg's vision compels us to hang on every word and to make the most of every minute, even on a Friday night. <laughs> because here at Beloit, where our students develop and hone a bottomless appetite for learning, it is at the end of the day the application of that knowledge, its practical service to both the students themselves and the worlds they inhabit that is most urgently sought. It is an understanding of how to translate the liberal arts education students receive here to a purposeful life of consequence. It is, Dr. Talao, an understanding of nothing less than your life's work. Weisberg chairs are individuals who know intimately how to apply their talents and spend their energies in the service of their communities, their countries, and their world. And they are master teachers. For a week at this school, they are mentors, role models, sages, and they have been to a person captivating, gracious, and inspiring. Over this week, Dr. Talao, you have been all these things and more. This week matters because the story of your life and work, Dr. Talao, matters. Marvin Weisberg's vision matters. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity in lectern to also thank and congratulate Beth Doherty, legendary Manger family professor of international relations, and Elizabeth Betsy Brewer, director of international education without peer for their service to Beloit College and the Weisberg Chair. These two individuals can both be blamed and applauded for their complete lack of any conscience in scheduling Dr. Talal's time here, and for their creative, complete, and unprincipled focus on helping our students, faculty, and community enjoy the full benefit of this opportunity with little or no regard for Dr. Talal's well-being. Again, welcome and thank you for being here. And most of you, thank you, Dr. Talal, for your energy, your talents, and your time. And may your voice, Dr. Talao, a voice we have all come to hear one more time, last at least one more hour. <laughs> My pleasure to introduce you, Professor Beth Doherty.
First, I would just like to echo Scott's thanks to our benefactor, Marvin Weisberg, who unfortunately couldn't be here um, this evening. He would just be delighted to see all of you here. And while we're on the subject of attendance, uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, second floor of Pearson's, will be the follow-up panels on global health, and we hope to see all of you there as well. I'd also like to thank the other members of the Weisberg Committee for all of their dedication and hard work, Betsy Brewer, Donna Oliver, Paulo Toral, Josh Moore, and Susan Cleverton. It is my very great honor tonight to introduce to you Dr. Sheila Klo, the 11th Weisberg Chair in International Relations. She is a scholar, a teacher, an academic, an activist, and a politician. Her work on gender, health, and human rights have earned her an international reputation. And in fact, she came to Beloit College this week from the United Nations, where the task force that she chairs um, had released its brand new report on women, girls, and HIV AIDS. From 2004 to 2008, she was the Minister of Health of the Republic of Botswana. She has since returned to her true home, the University of Botswana, where she is a professor of nursing. Dr. Klo holds a PhD in nursing sciences and postgraduate certificates in women's health and gender studies from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She did a master's degree at Columbia University and a master of science degree at the Catholic University of America. Dr. Klo has been involved in the fight against HIV AIDS in Botswana since 1985. She has played a key role in the development of national nursing and pre-medical education curriculum. She is the former director of a World Health Organization collaborating center in primary health care and has worked closely with the United Nations, including participating in the landmark Beijing Conference on Women's Rights. She is the United Nations eminent person on women, girls, and HIV AIDS in Southern Africa. She has published on numerous subjects, including HIV AIDS, menopause, um, community-based approaches to HIV AIDS, and older persons. She has received numerous international and national awards, among them the 2007 Women Leading Change Award from the World YWCA, the 2004 Aman Ghassadi Award for Leadership in HIV AIDS, the 2003 Florence Nightingale Award from the International Red Cross Society, and the 2002 Botswana Presidential um, Order of Honor. Lastly, any biography of Sheila would be incomplete without mentioning her alter ego, Ma Ramozzo, the leading character in the best-selling ladies' number one detective agency novels. Alexander McCall Smith dedicated one of the books in the series to Sheila and her husband, Thomas, upon whom the main characters um, are modeled. And should Sheila ever decide to change careers, she clearly has a lucrative future ahead of her in movies and TV, playing Ma Ramozzo. Please join me in welcoming the 2011 Weisberg Terror, Dr. Sheila Klo. trying to, to look at this uh, scenery first, then I'll, I'll know where to start. And I like the scenery. Thank you very much for turning up this evening. Um, I, I want to really thank the, uh, you know, the Dr. Uh, Beth, as well as the, the Weisberg Committee, for deciding that uh, I fit the description of what they think a Weisberg chair should be, and convincing the other committee members that no, Let's get here. So, uh, and I had the chance of meeting uh, Marvin Weisberg in Washington, D.C. It is a pity he won't be with us today, but at least I got to see that, yeah, he may, may, may not make it, and I was grateful for that. I want to, you know, uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Scott Beerman, who has really, as you can see, been a great leader for this institution. I wish I had come earlier, you know, but then we wouldn't have been here. Okay, and um, indeed, I'm grateful. I want to thank the students who have been my, my own role models the whole week. I had a good time hopping from class to class to the point where I know this college. Maybe I should just look for a job here. Um, 
I already know which rooms to go to when somebody says MI. I don't even ask them, what is MI? It's, are you telling me to myocardial infarction? No, I know. It's, so it, 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 it's really great. And, uh, but lastly, I want to congratulate the students for the posters. These are really great. And uh, having been to a lot of World AIDS conferences, they would pass for a post poster presentation at any one of those conf conferences. So please clap your for yourself, you are, you are very proud of you, yeah. Okay. I'm going to be drinking water a lot. It is dry here, but uh, I did bring the warm weather, so you know, at least I'm grateful for that. I'm going to be telling you the story. It's a story of a country that was devastated. The story of a country that through leadership and a politically committed leadership was able to get itself out of the throngs of the AIDS epidemic. But the story of a country that is still struggling, even as we speak right now, with the AIDS uh, epidemic. And um, I will simply start by telling you and showing you where Botswana is, because sometimes you know, Botswana is a very peaceful country, it's very quiet, so a lot of people have no idea where it is. At least people are more educated now, they know it's in Africa, but there used to be a time when I said to somebody, I come from Botswana, and they tell me, is that close to Cambodia? So now at least people know it is in Africa, but then there are some people who say, is that close to Ghana? So no, Botswana is in Southern Africa, there it is. It's, you know, bound, it's really, as you can see, right in the center of Southern Africa. We don't even have access to sea. It's mostly desert. And, um, you know, I still remember my children seeing, seeing Lake Michigan for the first time. They were like uh, three, four. And one of them said, this is the biggest swimming pool I've ever seen. <laughs> he had never seen a lake. So anyway, that's where Botswana is. Yeah. Um, but... The topic we are here for right now is really HIV and AIDS. And uh, I'm going to take it and put it in perspective that it is a global crisis right now. It is the year. We've already had 22 million dying from HIV and AIDS. And at this present moment, 20 million people the world over are living with AIDS. And TB is the leading cause of death of people living with AIDS. But the sad truth is that Sub-Saharan Africa is the hardest hit kind of, uh, uh, you know, continent. Two-thirds of all people living with AIDS, and in fact, a third of all deaths, three-quarters of all deaths, are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Why? Mainly or because of the poverty, the lack of resources, and indeed, the stigma, um, you know, the lack of knowledge. And AIDS is also a gender issue, in that 61% of the women who are in, people who are infected are women. In fact, among adolescents, 75% of the population are girls. So that it is really a gender issue. And a lot of people sometimes say to me, how did you choose to, to be involved in the AIDS epidemic? And I say to them, I started first as a, as a feminist, as a gender activist. And I saw that if I'm a gender activist, there is no way I can leave HIV AIDS behind because it is a gender issue. Gender inequality throughout the world is there and it is fueling the epidemic. So, and of course it has resulted in 11.4 million African children who have been orphaned as a result of the epidemic. I'm going to try to be as fast as I can because our, I mean, I'm a politician, I could speak forever. <laughs> but I want this to be an interaction. I want to speak, but at the same time leave enough time that about 10 or so of you can be able to ask short questions. <laughs> okay, uh, that's the graph that is showing the, you know, the SD name, is the number of adult and child deaths globally due to HIV. As you can see, it, the, the, that graph has been peaking from 1990, and it is only leveling in the past like two, three years. So that, as you can see, there's a leveling and a little bit of going down. So that, to me, that, of course, that rep rep does represent what I think are windows of hope 
There are windows of hope in that AIDS deaths are starting to decline worldwide. Uh, you know, they're declining, but we still are talking about millions, 2.2 million, another 2.2 million. This year alone has been like, I mean, this past year has been like 1.4 million, so that we think we are going down. We have about 3 million people receiving ARV treatment, thanks to the, 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 the campaign by the World Health Organization of 3 million people by five, what they used to call three by five. We have managed throughout the world to put 3 million people on, on antiretroviral treatment, but it is only 30% of those who need antiretrovirals. So that 70% of the world out there still is still in need of those life-saving drugs and they have no idea where to get them from and as a result of that, there are still deaths. Uh, we've heard, however, the good news has been that through the Global Fund, through PEPFA, your own presidential um, um, AIDS relief, we, international funding has increased so that there has been more interventions, but we are hoping we can have even more so that the world can really be rid of, the, uh, of this scourge. And, but however, we know that no amount of money going towards ARVs would replace the fact that for every person who gets on drugs, five others are getting infected. So prevention and prevention and prevention is 28 times more effective than just treatment alone. Okay, now let's go to Botswana. And there are our cattle. Is, uh, Botswana is a, a big country. It's a country the size of Texas, with six million cattle, so that, but only two million people, so they're more than us. So we eat them, and we also export them to the European community. We got our independence in 66. It's a multi-party, multi-racial society, and really one of the most stable places in Africa. We were very poor at independence, but the diamond industry brought us from being a low developed country, one of the least developed countries in the world, to where we are now classified as a middle income in the country. It has had its pluses and its own minuses. Once you are classified as a middle income country, what it means is that a lot of the donors leave they go to other countries. So it's almost as if you get punished for developing. So, however, we were able to make our diamond revenue not be, become blood diamonds, and it's been used to develop the country, uh, you know, in terms of education, health, roads, you know, just the whole thing. We were able to witness, as a young girl, I was able to witness our own capital city being built from scratch. So. I am a living history when, when that is concerned. However, we still we have to know that it is still a developing country with real resource constraints. And within that country, we don't have billionaires or trillionaires, but indeed there are some in income disparities. And indeed, female-headed households are some of the poorer ones. So there we are, but it's also a happy country. There are our traditional dancers. It's something to behold. Once you see them, you feel like you need to stay in the country or at least be visiting it or, you know, often enough. And uh, that's also what Botswana has been famous for. The number one ladies detective agency, there's McCall Smith, the author, with Jill Scott, the lady who played Mara Moswa. I play it on stage. She plays it on Hollywood. I mean, how unfair is that? <laughs> anyway. But healthcare, we long, long before the Alma Atta Declaration, that was saying we should have accessible and affordable healthcare. Botswana was already starting to make sure that health services are available throughout the country. And it wasn't easy. This is a sparsely populated country with vast you know, distances to travel. So sometimes it meant you had to travel more than eight, you know, eight hours to go and have a clinic set up for only 500 people. But still, you know, that had to be done so that access to health has been seen as a human right for quite some time now. 22% of our budget goes to education, I mean to, to health. 27% goes to education. And of course, 
we it also include access to safe water and sanitation where, as I'm talking to you now, it is a desert, but 98% of our households have safe water. And I'm glad to report that only 5% of the budget goes to the military. If a lot of African countries could do that, we would be very far by now. So the story before HIV, as I said, it was a, we had a good primary health care, a good network of health posts, clinics, hospitals, everything, with 95% of the population within 10 kilometers of health facility, with family welfare educators motivating people at grassroots level to the point where our access to health care as well as our immunization coverages for children were just unparalleled in Africa. 97% access to antenatal care. I mean, that's like one of the best statistics you can ever get. We schooled skilled attendants at birth, also at postnatal care, and we even have done micellary care to ensure that women breastfeed properly, they are supported in that role of bringing up children. And of course, with that, since people are now used to using health facilities, we were able to bring our total fertility rate, that is the number of women that any one woman can have it, uh, uh, in their lifetime. We brought it down from like 5.6 all the way to 3.2, which means because they now had access to, con to contraception and all that. Over 90% 90 immunization coverage and a maternal, a maternal mortality rate, that was like high by, in, by international standard, but one of the lowest in Africa. It was 180 with a, an infant mortality rate of like 45. In fact, there was a time when it was 33 per thousand. So you felt, okay, we, were, we are really somewhere. But came AIDS. And um, when it first, uh, our very first case was in 1985. And a lot of us really thought, well, within five years, this thing will be over. Twenty-something years later, we are still programming for AIDS. So we have about 275,000 people infected with a prevalence of 17.1. It used to be 24. So that it, has, it did reach its peak at 24%. Among pregnant women, the prevalence is like one in three women infected. And mother-to-child transmission went all the way from, you know, zero to like 40 percent, so that a lot of women were trans transmitting the virus to their children. But, you know, a lot of diseases do spare healthcare workers. This time, no healthcare worker was spared. No politician was spared. You know, it would get a minister in the same way that it would get a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist. So that this affected quality of care as we were losing our own health personnel. You can imagine a country where we train our people and education is free, all the way from kindergarten, all the way to university. So immediately after that person graduates, they die. So that it was really affecting even the quality of life just within the country itself. Maternal mortality rose up to where it reached 300 per 100,000, and infant mortality, there was a 17% increase right there. So we had orphans, 66,000. So that now it meant whatever little money that we're having, all that had now to be shifted to AIDS care. We were no longer looking at people as holistic human beings who needed total care. It was more like, you know, AIDS, let's do something about AIDS because we, some of us have witnessed situations where in major villages, over one weekend, there would be like more than 10 funerals. And we didn't even know which one to attend because we are all related to each other. It's a very small community. We are intermarried, we are whatever. So that when, when we had 10 funerals, it was like, which one do I go to? You had to really sit down and choose and be hoping about. So we knew something had to be done and done fast. Even our own leaders had to go from a state of denial where it was where is the other countries that are really affected, countries such as Zambia, Uganda, to where they knew that we have a problem right in the country. 
so that uh -oh, uh, it, it refuses. <laughs> the, re the response was really great. We, it really showed that then political will and commitment. The government had to decide that we are going to program for HIV. And it was the first African country to decide that we are going to actually put money and budget for health and HIV. So we, we started with uh, working with some drug companies where we had to say, can you bring down the, the cost of the drugs? And some agreed, some would say, if you buy such this quantity, I'll be able to provide this for free. So we got drugs from Beringa in Leheim, for example, such as uh, Nevirapine for free. And uh, we had to buy other drugs from them. So that we were actually the first country. But the real intervention started in 1999 after President Mohai became president. And he simply decided during my term as president, I might as well try to see what I can do for my country. So he became president in 1999. That very, 1998, that very year, he announced during our independence celebration, which is September, that come 1999, we are going to have programs to, 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 to prevent mother-to-child transmission. There had been a study at that time done in Bangkok, Thailand, which was showing that if you give AZT to mothers at 34 weeks of pregnancy, it reduces the, 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 the virus, and therefore the, 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 the child is likely to be born HIV-free. And we decided we'd have to embark on that one with the cost of a, you know, AZT as they were. So that now, we were the first country to do so. And it, it, since now, we, we had already the whole network of, of, of health services. The rollout was the one that was not easy. But as I'm talking to you now, we have 100% access. And we provide women with AZT, but mostly now we actually provide them with heart. Starting at 20, with heart is the highly effective antiretroviral treatment. Starting with eight, at 28 weeks. And for a lot of women, now when we give them the ARVs, it simply means that they can actually choose to breastfeed. And a lot of them do choose to breastfeed because they know that the viral load is that low that they can uh, be comfortable. We live in a country where most women, more than 94% of the women breastfeed, as you can see, this very, um, uh, you know, delighted women so that we, we were at least able to give mothers that chance to give that kind of nurturing to their children. Now, when I became minister, transmission was 40%, mother to child. And we were able to program such that in 2008, it, it had gone down to 3%. As I'm talking to you now, it's 2%, and we will not rest until there is zero transmission. So that's where we are. The challenge, of course, is really ensuring safe infant feeding because uh, we want this, the children to, to have HIV-free survival, but at the same time, we want to ensure that those women who decide to give formula do so safely so that the child is not then killed by other um, uh, effects. We had had an episode where we lost quite a number of children due to contaminated water. So that that then made us say, okay, we are now going to give ARVs to women so that they can really, most of them can breastfeed. Now, programs that we have, the first one of course was mother to child transmission, but we have to take care of the children so that we have, you know, periodic treatment, care and support. Now, it used to be we could only diagnose children when they were 18 months, but through research, uh, we have been now be able to diagnose children as early as six weeks because they now, we now use dry blood spot, uh, the DNA. So it has been very easy because as the mother brings, comes for antenatal, uh, postnatal checkup, you are then able to you know, check the baby and see if it is infected or not. And if it is, right away we put them on treatment so that we have a lot of children, over 16,000 children on treatment and it's about 90% of those eligible. The other 10% sometimes are caught very late because the women may have decided to go to a postnatal checkup, but then leave the baby or you know things like that. But we do follow up to just ensure that 
we have most of the children that are eligible on treatment. And of course, we have now children who are in their teens who are surviving. Uh, so the challenge is prevention counseling because these people are basically uh, growing, they are sexual beings, and they should know that they, yeah, they are living with HIV and can transmit it. So can transmit it so that much as we have very healthy children like these ones, we want to ensure that they grow up healthy and ensure that there is no transmission then to other um, uh, uh, individuals. Another program is really the protection of orphans and vulnerable children. Uh, of course, the first thing to do was to really ensure that we don't have orphans in the first place. So we had to roll out an ARV program that, that was targeting everybody else apart from just mothers. So that one started in 2001 and the uptake now is almost 100%. And being a gender activist, I'm proud to report that 60% of those are women, which shows that indeed it is in proportion to the number of women infected because we have more women infected than males. Now, the parents are alive so that you find that as a result of that, even the number of orphans actually has gone down because we, when the parents are, are fine, then we, you don't have orphans. But the, the, the great part has been that together with making sure that we prevent orphanhood has been to say, what do we do about those who are there, who are alive? Okay, our total fertility rate does uh, require, or at least it, it does inspire families to be able to take the children in, so that the caregivers are normally within their own, um, within the own family. However, there are some orphans that are not in, taken over by relatives, or we have no relatives. So that if you look at this picture, these are children who are at the SOS, one of the orphanages, where you know there is. They are taken care of as by house mothers. Every house mother has like eight children, so that they are, they are taken care of in orphanages. But the government makes sure that this provision of uniform, toiletries, food baskets to assist caregivers, so that any one caregiver therefore is does not under is not under that burden of having to care for extra children with your limited resources. There has been that, but. Our major challenge now is that psychosocial support. Let's face it, you may be an orphan being taken care of in the extended family, but the truth of the matter is you are an orphan and you have lost your parent. And sometimes it's a parent that you actually so die. So that those children need counseling. And that's where sometimes due to you know, shortages social, of social workers or psychologists and all that, you find that that is still still missing. And we try by means to do the most we can and involve the, the priests as well as people living with HIV AIDS because people living with AIDS have been our major ally. As a network, it's a very strong network, so we've had to rely on them a lot on things that could be done maybe by health professionals to simply say, can you come and help? Us here. For example, we have the IPT, the, 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 the tuberculosis therapy for people with AIDS, with AIDS. We have been able to actually engage PLWAs themselves to be able to ensure that that directly observed treatment occurs. And that has maintained an ad adherence levels of over 90%. Now, this is a slide after my own heart. That's why I decided I'm not going to put anything, not a single picture on it. Prevention among young people. As I said, in Botswana, we have free schoolings, free schooling with meals provided. And before, we had encountered a lot of resistance among parents when we were saying, look, the children are ignorant. And it was like, no, we are not going to have any sex education in the schools. If you teach the children sex education, they will do it. And we told them they already do it. <laughs> you know? So it took the parents seeing you know, young adults dying 
and knowing that some of these young adults who are dying were infected as teenagers, because the, 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 I mean, the, the disease takes that long, at least 10 years, for it to show. And um, PTAs then sat down and said, look, we don't want to be part of it because we are not comfortable, but let the teachers do it. So we had to go forth and train teachers to be able to, 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 to do that information and do it as sensitively as possible so that life skills education is now integrated in primary and secondary schools, as you know, elementary as well as high schools. Now, this one was something after my own heart. And I had to really make sure as a minister I followed the statistics because it needed to convince the conservatives out there that, look, we are in a world that is changing and we have to change <coughs> accordingly because this disease is saying we have to change. So that a lot of our children are very much aware of HIV, how it's transmitted and all that. But the great part has been the prevalence has gone down by 30% among young adults. Not only that, we were also able to measure teenage pregnancy where it went from 23% all the way to 10% in 2008. So that we have fewer teenagers getting pregnant. Not only that, they are, because they have now been armed with the information, they have been able to postpone sex. Oh, where before they were having it at 17.4 years on average, it's actually gone down to 18.6 years proving that knowledge is power. And giving children knowledge does not necessarily mean that they're going to necessarily have rampant sex. It simply means that they are going to use that knowledge to have responsible sexuality. So we have seen even HIV prevalence among 15, year old, 15 to 19 year old go down to 6.6%. Granted, some of these figures are still high, but they have given us that impetus now to say, let us see if we can now not have intergenerational communication, where granted, teachers can do it, but parents should also have the courage to be able to talk to their own children at home and not necessarily say, you better not do it, or don't do it, not the do's and don'ts, but let's sit down and discuss what the world is like today and how you can prevent yourself from becoming infected. So that's really where, you know, where we are now. Now, more is still being done. Prevention is a priority. I did say in my earlier slides that for every, throughout the world, for every one person who is put on ARVs, about four or five others are getting infected. So that we had to develop a national prevention program that is looking at abstinence, being faithful, condomizing, and change of behavior as well as male circumcision. Because I'm sure some of you have heard that male circumcision has been shown to reduce the rate of infection among men. Now as a gender activist, I had to put that one last because the last thing I wanted was males to be circumcised and then think they are new and go around infecting people. So it was integrated within the gamut of the already prevention strategies that we had to ensure that there is continuity of changing behavior. So special attention is being um, paid for prevention, especially among youth and young women. And for this, of course, we need male involvement. We've had to have uh, collaborations with members of parliament, and they started the men's sector, the very sector that can go around the country, teaching our men and convincing them that it is macho to care, it is macho to test, and yes, it is much to be able to love and be faithful. So we have used that, and they have also teamed with um, the, 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 the uniform source forces, the soldiers as well as the policemen. So we are doing all we can, and we are hoping that as we see the numbers go down, this will also inspire people to continue the fight, because the idea is that we should not stop until each and every one person is no longer infected. So um, we want to strengthen psychosocial support for orphans and vulnerable children, as well as their caregivers, so that we can have, be able to have a stress-free an environment as possible. But also to try and uh, you know, collaborate with our civil society 
as well as the private sector so that we ensure long-term sustainability. Because part of the question that we always ask ourselves is, okay, we've done so much, and we are the, an example in the world that even in resource-limited settings, you can roll out treatment, prevention, ARVs, and can be successful. But is it sustainable? And my answer is, it's sustainable only if we can beef up on prevention and make sure that the levels of prevalence go down. That, as long as we don't have any more people being enrolled, you know, and, or, or, or being infected, we can be able to sustain that because in the ultimate, we have seen that we have to put our money and prioritize it and put it where it is most needed. Um, however, more can be done. More can be done and I would not end, I could not end without uh, looking at your role, especially your role, you the students. This one is really to the students. The first thing you need to do, how you can then be part of the citizens of the world, the first would be to learn and become active in the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. I have been able to ask some students what are the Millennium Development Goals, and some of them had no idea. So it is an assignment, and I will be here in three years' time. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a response to the world's main challenges of hunger and poverty, illiteracy, gender inequality, maternal and child <laughs> mortality, environmental degradation, HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. And indeed, if you look at these problems that have been seen as the world's main challenges by United Nations, the whole, all the countries of the world, these are really the problems that are, you know, are, are, are affecting each and every society that we live on now. Whether it's in the developing world or in the most developed countries, we still have these as real problems that need to be addressed. Some more than others. We need to be able to integrate a gender perspective in everything that you do or in everything that you intervene in. If you are given an assignment, you know, write that assignment but find out whatever it is I'm writing, am I really a write, writing about the experiences of men and women? Are the experiences the same or those of women are likely to be different? It's really that. We can only change the world if we ensure that the other half of the population is well accounted for. Okay, and the last thing, of course, is really advocate for youth empowerment. You are youth. Advocate for empowerment of, with knowledge of responsible sexuality because in the ultimate, you are the ones who are the leaders of today as well as the leaders of tomorrow. And you may be leaders of tomorrow with no people to lead. Part of the reason why I had to intervene was simply that in future, I'd like to be voted back into office. And if there is nobody to vote me in, then what's the point? I have to ensure that I save people so that they can vote me in. So, so with that, let me simply say thank you very much. and. Uh, it's been a pleasure you know, talking to you. Thank you. by recognizing the one man who is leading this great institution. To say that I was very impressed with the knowledge that the students have about HIV and AIDS. The knowledge that they have about HIV and other proble pro pro problems in other countries. And indeed, the devotion, especially by the students who are in the uh, social science and uh, health, public health majors. I'm pretty impressed and I want to recognize you 
as an age champion by pinning this pin on you. That shows the devotion of Beloit, ready to change the world and fight against HIV AIDS. So please come on. Thank you very much. <laughs>